Welcome to the Cannabis Equipment News Podcast. Hi, I'm David Manti, and welcome to a new episode of the Cannabis Equipment News Podcast. With me this week is Michael Drozd, CEO of ACT Laboratories. Thank you very much for joining me today, Michael. Great to be here. Thanks for having me. Hmm. Well, before we get started, please make sure to like, share, and subscribe to the podcast. You can also help us out a lot by leaving the podcast a positive review on whatever platform you use. If you want to email the podcast, you can reach me at david at cannabisequipmentnews.com with email the podcast in the subject line. You can also subscribe to our daily newsletter. Make sure you get it delivered to your inbox first. Michael, I always like to start the podcast by learning a little bit more about your personal journey to the cannabis industry. So how did you get started? That's a great question. Um, I didn't start my life thinking I was going to be in the cannabis industry. I uh, actually started uh, my, my background is electrical engineering and economics. And I started my life as an entrepreneur. I started a few companies along the way, ended up in the food world. So I ended up in the in, uh, having a food company, uh, got the attention of a big company called Eurofens, who's the largest testing lab in the world. Eurofens liked my food background, but didn't have an opportunity in, in food at the time. And they said, hey, we've got this great ag bio division. We'd love you to take over. And I joined the first day and they said, um, and by the way, we're going to start doing uh, cannabis testing. And I'm like, well, I know nothing about it. That's, that sounded great. But I, that's really my first foray into the industry was back in 2015 when Eurofin started looking into the cannabis market as, a, as an opportunity for testing. Uh, and I just found it fascinating. I got really, really intrigued by the market, the opportunities, the dynamics in the market are just phenomenal. It changes every day, regulatory, consumer-based, everything about this market changes and for someone like myself, it becomes an exciting place to be. So I'm, I'm really loving this industry. It's a great industry to be in. So are you still affiliated with Eurofins or when did you split off and start ACT Labs? I did not start ACT Laboratories. I got recruited to be the CEO and I started oh, okay. ACT Laboratories uh, back in October of last year. Okay. Prior to that, I was with Eurofins. How, uh, how did you take the entrepreneurial route um, coming from electrical engineering? Just because... You know, having worked with a lot of engineers and having many of them in my family, they kind of like to, you know, <laughs> engineer and that's it. You know, so how did you kind of expand into the entrepreneurial side? Oh, great question. Yeah, it's funny. I grew up in a family of entrepreneurs. Uh, everybody in my family had started businesses of some sort. So it became kind of the natural progression. And my mom, uh, remember she told me one day, you need to be an electrical engineer. And I was like, why? She goes, well, you can make a lot of money at it. Okay. So I went down the electrical engineering path, not because of necessarily a passion for electrical engineering, but a passion for business, knowing that background, electrical engineering can lead me to more business opportunities. And it definitely has paid off. I think it's a great training for any kind of entrepreneurs having an engineering background. So okay, typically engineers have a more of a linear way of thinking about the world. So that's that's not me necessarily. So you were born into it. Are you winning family-wise? Yes, I think so. <laughs> <laughs> because with the number of siblings, I certainly understand the importance of that. <laughs> um, so how did ACT become one of the largest testing networks in the United States? Yeah, great, great question. So, um, you know, the founder, Jeff Nemeth, really had a vision back in the day. He wanted to, he, he saw this emerging cannabis testing market early on and said, hey, look, if I can get all these labs set up very quickly, I can gain market share in all these states. So his his model was, let's do it really quickly, set these labs up in different states. And then he partnered with a group called Intrinsic Capital Partners, uh, who's the private equity firm behind it. And that allowed and gave the capital to really expand these states quickly. But his vision was, hey, if we can create all these labs in different states, we can then create standardization. Even though the states have different regulatory environments, we can create a standard for sort of method development that every all the states really share the same sort of underpinning of what what's there, all of the regulations of the states. And that becomes appealing for uh, MSOs. MSOs really like the fact that you have, you're in these multiple states with very, very similar, uh, really similar methods in all the states. And that that was a really nice model he set up. And uh, my job is to really take it to the next level. So, so you came on board in October. Um, how, when was ACT founded? I think it was founded in 2015. Okay. Okay. When you came on board, um, you know, what were some of the things that you brought to the table that you thought made it a good opportunity? Yeah. A lot of my experience coming from Eurofins, Eurofins has a, um, a very operational intensive model. They, they believe, uh, it's funny, they, they really believe that if you can create great operations, you'll get customers and retain customers. So very heavily focused on turnaround time, a very heavily focused on, uh, you know, consistent results. 
that's sort of the underpinning of the Eurofins model and that entrepreneurial model of trying to find new opportunities. So kind of combining the Eurofins structure of of the operational excellence really being at the at the center of everything really is what I'm kind of bringing to the table of ACT is, is that operational experience, operational knowledge to really run great labs. And at the end, if you run great labs, customers love that. The operational excellence is um, one thing that I noted in particular. Why is it important to have quality systems that go beyond industry requirements? A lot of reasons. You know, I... I um, I'll get, I'll get on sort of my, my passion area. You know, if you, um, you know, if you go to a store and, and you buy Advil, right. You, you know, and it's 200 milligram Advil and all of a sudden they give you 150 milligram Advil. What would your response be? You'd be pissed. <laughs> uh, although it's probably tested the right standards at the end of the day, it's 150 milligram Advil. Yet I bought a 200 milligram or take another extreme. You've got a cancer drug that you're applying. Your, your, your doctor gave you this cancer drug and it's not what's exactly what the cancer drug is supposed to be. That's that's incredibly important to have that that quality system in place to really go beyond any standards that are out there to make sure that at the end customers are protected. I mean, our, our job as a lab is is customer safety first and foremost. We have to have that as the underpinning of, of what we do and really be the gatekeeper between you know between the brands as, to the consumers. And at the end, what that does is also build build this concept of brand loyalty. Uh, why do you go when you go to a, a pharmacy? Why do you why do you buy Tylenol instead of Walgreens acetaminophen? You know, some people do buy it. Why do, Tylenol and that brand are the same? It's because people trust the the Tylenol brand. They know if they buy Tylenol, it's what's in the product. So a, a lot of these things, in terms of like quality systems, why you go beyond is is really to create that brand loyalty from consumers. They go on the shelf, they recognize that MSO brand. Oh yeah, that I, I can trust that brand, and that's why that's why we do what we do. The, the regulators have created a great environment for actually creating great regulations. But I think as a lab, we have to go beyond that to make sure consumers are always safe. Does the cannabis industry have a problem with lab data? I, I think they do. I think they do in general. Um, you know, I'm coming out of a different environment, uh, Eurofens being everything from pharmaceutical to ag testing. But what you see in this industry is you, you don't see the headlines you see in the cannabis space. Every day, you know, I, I read the news and every day it's another recall. It's another cannabis brand being fined. And, and it's getting... It's getting more. It's getting the the intensity is picking up. There are more and more of these coming out every single day. The headlines showing it, and I think that's a reflection of what's going on in the space right now. Uh, I think consumers are, are gradually losing confidence in the space. And we look at the growth. What's going to call this industry to grow at the end of the day? The legal market will grow by having confidence in the marketplace. Why would somebody buy a legal product when they buy an illegal product for a lot, lot less money? And at the end of the day, one of the big drivers is they know that product is safe because it's been tested. They, they recognize it. And if they start, if consumers start to lose that confidence, they're going to move away from that legal market, is my opinion. Is the problem with how the labs are run, the equipment that they have in-house, the regulations that they um, are trying to abide by, or a combination of all of the above? It's a combination. I, I can't speak to the other lab practices, uh, but what I can speak to is if you, if you kind of follow the money at the end of the day, the money at the end of the day says, you know... A brand makes more money by high, having a higher potency on the shelf. Uh, if they've got 25% THC versus 20%, they can sell that product for more. There's a there's a direct economic incentive that for a brand, not saying brands do this, but there is an incentive for the brands to do it. For the lab, they want the business. They want the business of making sure that potency shows a higher potency. So you're you're creating an incentive there then to pull that potency higher because you know the the they can sell they can sell more money. The the lab gets the business. The problem is the people who, who suffer in the end is the consumers. The consumers suffer. Again, that Advil example, I bought a 200 milligram Advil, yet I got 150 milligram Advil. You know, mm-hmm. I, I expect a 200 milligram Advil if I buy that. And that's where it comes back to in the end, back to consumers. To what do you attribute a lab's willingness to behave that way? Because to me, it seems short-sighted and risky in terms of whether or not you're still going to have a lab in a couple of years once you're kind of smoked out. Um, what is the incentive and how long do you think a lab has before it's sort of uncovered that they're maybe not completely above board? You know, it, 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 uh, it really depends, I think, on the state environments. You know, I, 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 I have a tremendous amount of respect for our state regulators. They do a phenomenal job overall across the board, but they're also stretched very thin. I mean, they've got a lot of, a lot of things on their plate and not enough time necessarily to regulate, and they've got limited resources on how to do it. 
So it really becomes a question of how of how deep those regulate you know regulators can really step in and try to figure it out. And I think that's where you know the whole trust and testing program really came out of it. Uh, let's set the bar. Let's be the let's be the you know let's be on the side of angels. Let's create our create an environment where we're on the side of angels. And I think that's where this trust and testing idea kind of came out of is let's let the lab shine the light on the industry. Let's make sure that we're 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 make sure we're out there present regardless of what the regulators how much they have on their plate. Let's be that bar, if you will. And before we get into the, uh, is it truth and testing or trust and testing? It's trust and testing. Trust and testing. Okay. Um, before we jump into that a little bit more specifically, I wanted to ask about conflicts of interest. So should individuals with a stake in other parts of the industry be able to be involved with labs? I can only give my personal opinion. I don't think so. I, I think you you don't want the hens watching the hen. I mean, the fox watching the hen house. In my opinion, mm-hmm. I think that separation between labs and other people needs to stay present. I don't. I don't think it's good. You know, you see other industries where they're able to self regulate. The pharmaceutical industry does more self regulation. It's also a very very evolved industry that's highly regulated by the FDA. We're not there in the cannabis space. Mm-hmm. You know, we're not a federally regulated program anywhere. We don't have those resources. We don't have that. Um, so I, I think for at least right now, the industry, I think that separation between lab and everything else has to stay stay in place, in my opinion. And that was one thing that kind of blew my mind too, and I never thought would be possible, is that an operator could also operate as a consultant for a lab, which I understand because they're kind of talking about what they need when it comes to testing. But then when it comes to potentially having an ownership stake in it, um, it kind of blew my mind. Yeah. It is interesting. You don't see that necessarily a lot of other industries typically, but Mm -hmm. um, this industry is, is, you know, it's still evolving industry. It's a very nascent industry. Right. Uh, I think that's what we're seeing right now. You you know, you see some parallels back to generic drugs back 20, 30 years ago. It had some of the similar, similar things where generic drugs was, was really the wild west back then. Uh, Not as not strong regulations, didn't have the regulations that the, the, the other pharmaceutical companies had. But over time, it's evolved. It's really become a very, you know, when people go to get, go to the store and get a generic drug, they trust it now. Whereas mm-hmm. 20 years ago, you wouldn't necessarily have that same trust of a generic drug. I think that's the evolution of where we're heading as a market. And then that's a good thing. I think the good thing for the growth of the industry. See, that's why those off-brand Flintstone vitamins weren't doing anything for me as a kid. <laughs> Probably not. No regulation. Um, so you had, uh, you had mentioned it, but a big part of the reason that we're talking today is because you recently launched the Trust and Testing Certification Program. Why did, why did you launch it and what is it? Yeah, yeah, really fundamentally, we launched it because of, you know, SC Labs and, our, and ACT Labs really got together as the largest labs in the country and said, we really need to do something. We keep seeing these headlines coming out every day. And we want to step up as a, as a lab and say, no, you know, we want to set the bar. We want to make sure this is not happening. So we try to, we try to think of different ways we could do it. And ultimately the, it came down to if we create a certification program that, that consumers could trust, you know, a consumer facing brand essentially saying, just like certified organic, you go see an organic product, you know, that product has gone through the rigor of making sure that it's, it's, it's truly organic. And I think that was kind of the impetus behind our side is really trying to understand the consumer mindset. We want to give consumers confidence. You know, our goal at the end of the day, we 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 uh, we've all been in this industry for a while. Uh, we want we want to be successful. We want the industry to be successful, and we know at the end of the day, by us working together as as a lab environment, we can make the we we have the ability to make this this a very successful market. If on the other hand, we go down the path of still being the wild west, eventually it's going to erode the market because consumer confidence is going to erode, and that's really fundamentally why we came up with the program. So. Is trust and testing going to be driven by the consumer, by the lab, or by the operator or the brand? You know, I think it's going to be lab driven at the end of the day. I mean, it's still an evolving process where we are. The labs at the end of the day will could be setting the standards of where we need to be as, as a lab, as a lab industry, where the lab industry needs to be at the end of the day, setting those standards. The regulars have their standards and those are great standards. We just want to make sure we're complying with those standards and going beyond any way we can to meet those standards for consumer safety. But in the end, it becomes a consumer facing. Uh, it, the trust and testing is ultimately consumer facing. You want the consumers to have that confidence. So the consumer will have say in it. Uh, the MSOs will definitely have say in it, no doubt. I mean, they will say things that are important to the consumers and won't. The consumers are the ultimate voice at the end of the day, what they want to see. But that's where the program is really headed at the end of the day. So how does a lab receive 
trust and testing certification? Yeah, that's something we're still evolving and working on. That we've got some stuff on the website now in terms of the criteria we're putting out there, things like state-of-the-art quality systems, mm-hmm. uh, different requirements we're putting in place to make sure a lab does comply with what's needed to be a trust and testing lab. Uh, but over the next few months, you'll see more and more coming out of us in terms of what that what that program looks like. Okay. Is there any issue with this looking like to other labs, like the two biggest labs want everyone to play by their rules? You know, I hope not. I hope instead we get a, uh, you know, an environment where people feel like they want to be part of it and collaborate. And all we all join together as a lab community and say, we're going to do what's right for the consumer at the end of the day. That's my hope. Okay. So the end game, you've talked about it a lot, is safer products. Um, and also the ability to prevent recalls, I assume as well. Um, I feel like a lot of this would be driven by the brand as well, just because when it comes to those recalls and those headlines that you're talking about, those can do permanent damage to brands. They can. I, and I, you know, we've seen it, I, I saw it over and over in the food industry as well. Uh, one recall would actually destroy an entire food company. Mm-hmm. And that's what you hope sort of at the end of the day is this industry evolves. You want to see more of that. You want to see more of that, uh, that energy to know that, hey, a recall is very expensive for us. It's not something we ever want to go through. So we do everything in our power as, 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 you know, as a cannabis brand to make sure that doesn't happen. Okay. Now, I, I don't think we're quite there yet as an industry right now. Some of the requirements for the certification that you've been talking about on the website include proficiency testing and quality management. What does that entail? Again, we're still working on some of the details of what that really means in, in say, but, but, you know, the idea at the end of the day is having proficiency, meaning a third party evaluation of what's being going on there beyond sort of the standard ISO certification. Mm-hmm. Uh, state of the art quality systems just really means using, you know, and again, having a third party look at it and a, an evaluation, making sure that the quality systems that are put in place are making sure that consistency is always there in every product well beyond what necessarily the state would require in terms of ISO, this would be a way of just really truly monitoring what those state, those state of the art quality systems are being used day to day. So ideally, do you envision one of the safety regulators in the industry kind of picking up this ball and then offering the certification? You know, that would be ideal. I think at the end of the day, I, I don't know. <laughs> again, we, I don't think this is something we launched and don't know where it's going to grow into. Mm-hmm. Uh, to me, that would be an interesting, an interesting angle. If someone picked it up and had certifying bodies like uh, in the ISO world, you have A2LA and PGLA as different certifying bodies. It'd be interesting to see if a body like that picked up a program like this and said, hey, we're going to make this part of our, our certification. I think that would be great. One of the things that also caught my eye is that um, you want there to be an ethics training angle. Yeah. Why was that important to include? You know, again, it it it... <sighs> It, it, it's challenging, you know, you, you end up following the money and sometimes uh, what Gordon Gecko, I say, greed is good. I don't necessarily agree with that always. You know, I, I think that we have to, uh, there's a certain amount of, yes, you can make money doing these things, but at the end of the day, is it ethically what you should be doing? And so I, I think from our side, that's really where it came in is that ethic standards of, of labs has to be in place. You know, we have to all be ethical and recognize if we, if we, slide things down the, the wrong path, yes, we can make more money, but is that really the right path for the industry at the end of the day? Is that right for the consumer safety? And that's where the ethics training really comes in, is making sure that we're always on the side of angels, mm-hmm. ultimately. Is it possible for everyone in the industry to see beyond sort of that greed is good mentality? I mean, for me in particular, the cannabis industry at least seems very collaborative and forward thinking when it comes to sustainability initiatives and kind of, for lack of a better term, trying to do things right. But they're also kind of hamstrung by a lot of regulations and taxes and, you know, a lot of hands in their pocket. Um, you know, in a lot of times that kind of is the uh, the wrench in the entire machine. I, I agree. You know, I, I feel so bad for the cannabis brands out there. They they've got a constant uphill battle. I mean, it's it, it's everybody has their hand reaching into their pocket while they're trying to make money. And ultimately, this industry, these these brands have to make money. I mean, that's another reason the, the brands have to survive is to make money. Mm-hmm. Um, so there's that. There's definitely no doubt there's a, there's a driver, an economic driver for us to all make money, labs included. Labs have to make money just like the, the brands do. I, get, I guess the, the thing that I want, it's that short-term decision versus long-term what's best the market. That's what I guess we're trying to avoid. Mm-hmm. The short-term making a bad ethical decision versus having the long-term where the industry needs to go. 
And we do need to continue to work with our regulators. We put that in our statement. Regulators are definitely going to be part of this process at some point, helping them, you know, what kind of regulations really make sense for the states, what, you know, to help these brands be as successful as possible, yet still keep consumer safety in mind. Um, okay. Taxes, I don't know what we can do about taxes. I'd love to find a way of lowering those taxes, but states are making a lot of money on those taxes right now. Um, so hopefully that 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 burden goes down for them as well. So. So for people that are interested, how do they join and how long do you envision it being before there's a trust and testing seal that can be put on a package? I think we're very close on the trust and testing seal. We've got the logo. We've got the trademark sitting out there right now. Uh, we are getting a lot of inquiries from a lot of different brands right now. Uh, I suspect it'll be short term. You'll start to see that brand actually on packages. I'm not give a firm timeline, but definitely something probably this year you'll start seeing on packages come out. Uh, in terms of joining it, that's one of the, the the processes we're going through with SC Labs now is understanding what that process looks like. You're going to see a lot more coming out on the in the next couple months on that process and what it takes to be part of the test and uh, trusted testing program. But that is something in the works right now for us. Will there be a cost associated with the certification? So you know, I just want to know if there could be any sort of like pay to play sort of conflict there. That's not our intent. Again, you know, our intent is 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 about the ethics of the industry and keeping consumer safety in mind. It's not something we're trying to charge for. We just want the visibility to be out there to consumers. At the end of the day, they can trust the products. They can trust the ingredients. They can trust the label. They can trust the products they have. And that's really what it's about at the end of the day. Okay. What kind of uh, staying power do you see the certification having? You know, is this something that after uh, federal legalization is still going to hold weight? I think it will. I really do. I think at the end of the day, you know, look at organic. I mean, I don't know when it came out, probably 15 years ago, it's definitely got staying power. Consumers buy things because it says sort of certified organic on it. Uh, I think that's a good, you know, so, somewhat a good example out there of, of, of staying power of a recognize on the label, you recognize what that product is and what it can do. And consumers recognize the value of that product. So yes, I, I think it definitely has staying power beyond federally being federally legal. I'd like to uh, go back to ACT Labs and just know a little bit more about how are things going at ACT Labs now? What are some of the trends that you're seeing in the industry in terms of people that are coming to you and what they're looking for in a lab partner? Yeah, it's, that's a good question. And, and it's it's interesting, the evolution we've seen. Um, you know, Initially, it, we, we saw there, there's always an emphasis on turnaround time. I'd say that's kind of the, the constant because you know, if you're if you're a grow, you want to get that product out as quickly as you possibly can, get it on the shelf, get consumers buying it because cash flow becomes important. Um, you know, we're seeing a lot more emphasis actually on the consistency of, of of products. You know, before consistency of testing has to be there. We're seeing more and more press for giving them consistent results. Uh, you know, being error free in our process is making sure that we, at the end of the day, don't don't make mistakes. But I'm also seeing a really interesting trend that. Um, I think is a good thing that, that, you know, sometimes we'll see every once in a while, we'll see a, a failure or something. Uh, maybe it be a heavy metal or maybe, um, maybe it's something on the microbiology side. Um, and, and, and what I'm seeing a nice trend is used to be, Oh, that's terrible. That's terrible. Now it's like, why is that? Why, why do we see that? And then, so you've got these, these brands out now looking at their own processes saying, how do we get better? We want to make sure that we're not having, you know, microbot. We don't, we don't, we don't want yeast to mold in our products. Where are we doing in our process? Maybe causing this, and I think that that um, that self awareness is becoming more important. Back to their own brand identity, I think they're recognizing the importance the labs play. In you know, yes, we're holding up maybe getting that product out the door, but they may have a product internally that they need to deal with, and so we're helping them and we're partnering with them to try to figure out what those problems are, so that in the end, again, the long term view, we solve that problem, so they don't have this problem in the future, and then. That's been, I think, I think that's been a really, really positive we see in the industry. And part of it is the headlines. I think the headlines are definitely causing an impact. They're seeing the recalls, those things kind of hitting, and they're recognizing they have to make sure they're 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 doing things better. And I think that's been a really, really positive trend in the industry right now for me. What does that troubleshooting or sort of root cause analysis process look like when you partner um, to try and figure out what's going on on premise? Yeah, we'll actually go into the grows themselves and try to figure out where the issue is. We have different environmental monitoring systems we put in place to see different aspects of it. We'll observe sort of what's in the, in the grow to really help them, you know, on a consultative basis to help figure out how to we can all improve. And I think that's been something that I've, I've really enjoyed is seeing the, the industry really embrace that. Hey, yeah, come on in, help us out, help us out where we can. 
And really, we're we're starting to create these, uh, if you will, best you know the the, the best standards out there for everybody. Uh, and I think that's been really uh, really a positive thing for the industry. When you run into these failures, whether they be on the microbiology side or metals, are there any remediation efforts that you trust above the other? Uh, you know, I really can't speak to that as much. I, I would like to, but I really, I've seen some things work and some things work, don't work, but uh, I feel like it's not my place as, as a lab to sort of uh, advise people. We will, when we actually work with a customer, we'll kind of tell them more about things we've observed. But at the end of the day, they've got to kind of go down the path they've seen to help really remediate the problem. Because every every problem is different. You know, it could come from the soil, it could come from the water, it could come from different different sources. And it's really, they need to understand every holistically what's happening in their process. So uh, okay. yeah. I can't comment directly on that. No, no worries. Um, I'd like to learn a little bit more about 8R or X footprint. How many states are you in now and where are you looking to expand? Yeah, we're currently in five states. Um, we're getting ready to expand in uh, Florida, Massachusetts, and New Jersey are our next three states that we should have online this year at some point. Okay. What are the five that you're in? Uh, we're currently in Illinois, Pennsylvania, Michigan, Ohio, and New York. Okay. Are there any states that, I guess, not that you necessarily stay away from, but you're not eager to jump into right away? You know, for us, it's, it's more of a geographical footprint of where we're trying to expand to. We're trying to kind of stay pretty much east of the Mississippi. And that's just more from a perspective of of uh, just, you know, expanding our wings too far. It becomes more difficult in terms of geography. So that, in our requirement, that's one of our requirements. Um, we definitely like the states that tend to be more progressive in terms of growing towards, you know, eventually adult use, mm -hmm. uh, more opportunity for the lab space. So we, you know, we respect all the states that are, that are only medicinal, which are great, but we tend to sort of look to states that are, that are adult use. Uh, you know, we, we see Florida eventually coming online with adult use, Massachusetts being in that category, New Jersey. Those are the ones that become more interesting to us because the market, the market becomes larger for everybody. Is it because some of the markets west of the Mississippi, Mississippi are more mature. It's more of a competitive landscape. There, there is a more competitive landscape, but you have new markets like New Mexico, uh, other markets kind of coming online. It, mm -hmm. It's for, more for us. It's more, yes, I guess the the newness of the East Coast becomes uh, interesting, but it's also just where our geography started to begin with. Okay. SC Labs, on the other hand, really covers the West Coast very well. They've got California, Oregon, Washington, and, and Colorado. So, Okay. Do you get on the regulation side of um, the industry at all where, you know, as we see states like New York come online, are you involved in the process and setting regs? Uh, yes, very much so. Not me personally. We have a, a, an amazing guy on our staff named Dr. Bob Miller, mm -hmm. who definitely works with regulators very, very, very well throughout all the states. Uh, and it's really a collaboration to, to the state regulators. They've got a hard job in front of them. And, and to their credit, they work very closely with, with people like Dr. Bob Miller, in creating those regulations, understanding what the regulations implications mean, not only the labs, but also to the brands and ultimately what they mean to the consumer. So we work in very close partnership with the regulators uh, in, in terms of not only developing new regulations, but understanding the existing regulations and the limitations. It's very, very important part of being part of the lab environment. When you started out as an electrical engineer, could you have ever foreseen yourself in the cannabis industry? Yeah, honestly, I, I say no. Uh, my grandfather used to joke about, uh, I grew up in, in a farm in North Carolina. My grandfather used to joke about all the time about growing uh, growing marijuana in his, in his fields, and we'd always laugh about it. And, uh, you know, sure enough, my cousin now is growing hemp in the fields now, the same, those same fields. Uh, so it's, it's maybe not that far away. But uh, no, it's interesting. I, I love, you know, it, it is a, uh, as everyone knows, it's a phenomenal plant. Uh, this plant has properties that nothing else in the world has. And it, it's, it's, uh, it's medicine that people rely upon every day. Uh, I, you know, I have a lot of faith in what this industry will do at the end of the day in terms of, of in the end, making, you know, really for consumers again and making making their lives better. And I think this plant has the ability to make lives better in a way that we've never seen before with anything. So it, it's an exciting industry to be in for that reason for me, knowing the impact we have on, on, on people. Obviously, it's in the family a bit, but do you have a personal connection to the plant at all? Uh, meaning what? Like, uh, do you have a history uh, as a user? Anyone in your family that's used it or anything like that? I've got family members who are more in the elderly side who, who use it for, for pain and those things. Uh, I'm not, uh, I'm actually not a user myself. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't really have that. I have a, uh, my own personal experience was with a, uh, with a, with a dog that I had that was, um, he was 18 years old. 
Mm-hmm. And a uh, little border collie, love that dog. Um, and he really wasn't able to get up anymore. So I started trying to, this is about five years ago, started giving him CBD. Mm-hmm. Sure enough, he started running around the yard again, all of a sudden. And I was like, wow, that's pretty interesting. And then next thing you know, he started kind of degrading again. And I said, well, let me let me try marijuana. Mm-hmm. Try, try it on him, THC and uh, incredible. <laughs> his his uh, He was back again to running around the yard for another two or three years. The dog lived for another two years. Uh, in a really healthy way. And so that my own personal experience was seeing the impact it had on my dog in terms of, of, of the quality of his life at the end of the day. And he died a very happy dog. So the veterinary side of this industry, I think is barely scratching the surface. And, um, one of the issues is I think kind of similar to, um, with, you know, uh, doctors is that vet vets are afraid to even speak on it. They are. Yeah. It's a problem. Uh, I had the same problem with my vet, and she warned me that was gonna I was gonna kill my dog. Yeah, literally, you know, told me you're gonna kill your dog, and I said, "Well, I know enough to know that's not the case." Mm-hmm. Uh, and at the end, you know, it, I I was right, and I I had so many other friends in the same position in the, in the vet world that their their vets told them absolutely not, and it's because it's a DA Schedule One, and they would lose their own DA Schedule One. I think if they if they said something positive about it, which I think is a shame. Mm-hmm. Um, I I hope that changes. I really do. What are your expectations for maybe some of the states that we might see come on <clears throat> come online next? And then, do you have a prediction for federal legalization? <laughs> I, I I will say my predictions have consistently been wrong about federal legalization. Uh, I thought back at, when I first jumped in this industry, 2015, 16, I, I really thought it was going to be legal within two or three years, and and here we are now, 2023. Um, you know, we have enough division in this in this country right now. I don't see it happening anytime soon. I think the the political divisions we have right now are so deep between red and blue that it just seems hard to believe they could ever come together on something as important as marijuana. I just don't see it happening. So my own prediction personally is being a little more pessimistic. I think we're probably three to five years out personally. Although, and the other problem you have is the states are making a lot of money at this. The states who legalize it really don't want it to be federally legal. I don't think because again, back to the money, they would lose some of that money if they're getting from, from taxes. And so there's a, there's a little bit of incentive, an economic incentive for them not to legalize it. But for the country, at the end of the day, it, it's it's a shame because the country does need to legalize it. It is such a an important part of our society. Uh, it needs to be legalized. So um, yeah, I, it's interesting to see what's going to happen in the evolution in terms of states. You know, it's interesting to see the evolution of states. Uh, states that um, you know, Missouri has really embraced it. I mean, they've really more con- what I would consider more conservative states really embraced it, and I think that's interesting. You see, traditionally a, a pretty red state like Missouri all of a sudden saying, "Yes, we're going to go forward." I think that's interesting. Um, and then you see other states that are, you know, North Carolina, my home state, I don't see it legalizing, I don't know when, you know, <laughs> 10 years from now, maybe they just really are, have a different stance on it. Um, so I, I think it's interesting that, that, that the, the, you know, the, the plant really uh, doesn't, it, it doesn't seem to really go by uh, red or blue as much. It, it goes by sort of where the needs are to the states. And I think that's interesting right now. So. Completely agree. Um, you know, my standard every episode a uh, plea for something to happen in Wisconsin but it's weird how it's <laughs> how it's overly politicized in different ways depending on the political landscape like you said it is it, it, it's it's a I, I love all the political ads that get put out there pro and for it it's just it's really fascinating to me mm-hmm. and I think it's pretty telling that typically pharmaceuticals end up being always in the side against it and I think that's to me that's a another testament to the plant, you know, pharmaceuticals that against this, this plant, it must have something there that they're afraid of. So I think that's a, that's pretty telling to me in the end of the day. I'm curious about how ACT um, gains its customer base. Is it more passive where they're coming to you just because you're known and uh, they require your services or every once in a while, do you catch a headline and say, Hey, we could help you. Uh, Kind of a combination. I'd say right now we're getting more of the attention from, from, um, we're getting a lot more of the attention from, especially the, the MSOs right now. Mm-hmm. Um, again, back to that standardization throughout the states, that's something they really want. Uh, they want to have, you know, if you get an Oreo in New York, you want it to be the same in California, same sort of concept for them. They want to make sure their testing environment is the same so that that Oreo is the same in both play, both locations. So we're getting a lot of pull, little, mainly because one, we're a, we're a you know, a, a great lab. And I, I feel very proud of the, of the lab we built, uh, not only from consistency and turnaround time, but just the people you work with, the, the people you deal with. But I think also from the MSO perspective, that standardization is becoming more and more important. And so a lot of it is we're starting to get the pull from the MSOs. Hey, we want to work with you because you, of your footprint. I think that's okay. been interesting. We still do market out there. We do, you know, try to obviously grab customers where we can, 
but that poll has been a very interesting, really more from the MSO side of things typically. Is it because MSOs have the resources to understand like risk analysis also? I think so. Yep. Yeah. Okay. They definitely, they definitely have a lot better feel for the risk, the risk reward side of things and understand the importance of, uh, not, I'm not saying the, the smaller, uh, there's a lot of small guys who totally understand the, the benefit of labs and they are very much in tune with what it, uh, the MSOs are seeing it more from the risk reward side, the financial side of what it means, uh, both, you know, the expense of the lab, but also the impact if they have poor quality results. So. Okay. Well, you may not have foreseen yourself in the cannabis industry, but, uh, you know, are you here indefinitely? I'm here forever. I love it. It's a great space. It is, a. Uh, I love the people in the space. It's very collaborative, just wonderful people to work with. I, uh, I thoroughly enjoy it every single day I'm in the space. Okay. Talking about some of the dynamics and trust in the industry, how has the industry evolved since you first got into it? And, you know, what were some of the things that surprised you and some of the things that you think maybe we're just not there yet? You know, honestly, the biggest surprise when I first got in the industry and the evolution has been on the banking side of things. That was, uh, I used to, I remember sitting at um, at the Colorado MED and watch people walking with suitcases full of cash. I mean, literally with cash in their hands, paying their taxes with cash. I, I just, that was shocking to me. <laughs> hmm. And I know the reality of why it, it just, you, you're like, no, it's a cash business. No, it really is a cash business. They literally have suitcases of cash. They have vaults in the back with cash in it. I, I think that's been a nice evolution that you're, you know, you're still not able to work in the federal banking system. Um, but there are ways of working sort of with the state banks and the credit unions in a way that I think that's been a really nice evolution for the marketplace. You know, I really hope they they pass some of the legislations out there. It makes no sense to have, you know, it, it makes no sense to have a cash-based business. It, no, it makes no sense to not have this cannabis industry open to, it's very challenging for for brands to get loans. It's very challenging for them to get financing. It, it's, it's they, this, they made it very, very difficult unnecessarily. And I think it, it introduces, at the end of the day, you know, I, I fully believe in the legalized cannabis market. Uh, I have nothing necessarily against the illegal market, but I just think the legal cannabis market is where we have to be. And anything you do to start encouraging that illegal market, I think is a bad thing. You start injure, you know, that black and that gray market has to be discouraged. And I think, you know, as a society, we have to do everything we can, especially in the banking system to encourage Hey, it's legal in the state. Let's make it easy for 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 it to actually do business in the state. It's been approved by the people of the state. Let's make it so they can actually do the business they need to do. And I think that's been one of the things that I've seen great progress on, but I'd love to see more progress on right now. Agreed. Um, you know, Michael, before we get out of here, is there anything else in particular that you want to make sure the cannabis equipment news audience either knows about yourself, Act Labs, or the trust and testing certification? Yeah, no, uh, just, you know, stay tuned on what on the trust and testing. We're, we're, uh, we're really excited about launching the certification. We've got a lot of interest from it. Uh, we'd love to hear from all your, your, your viewers about their, their pros and cons of what they see of, of what we're doing. And we'd love to take the feedback and do whatever we can with it. Uh, I just want to thank you for having the opportunity to speak to your, 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 your viewers today. I think it's really important to, uh, to get the message out there. And I really appreciate you stepping forward and allowing us to be part of your program. Yeah, absolutely. You're always welcome here. Um, and one thing that I didn't ask that I've completely fallen down on, how did the partnership happen with you and SC? Interesting. Yeah. So um, our our private equity group, Intrinsic Capital Partners, knows their capital partners fairly well. So it ended up being a dialogue really at the high level between, between the, uh, the capital partners. And then eventually... Uh, they they kind of brought it forward to, to myself and Jeff Journey, who's the CEO of, of of SC Labs, and we were both like, "Hey, this is great! <laughs> what a great concept! Let's let's be out there." So that's really the that's really kind of the evolution. It started really from the from the capital side, but really kind of pushing this idea down to us. And we both said, "This is a great idea. We think it, we something we have to move forward with." And they've been a great partner. They've been great to work with. Okay, I was going to just ask, how is it? Uh, how's it been? You know, working on both sides. It's been great. Uh, and it's funny, we, we overlap in one state, Michigan, but the rest of our geographies are completely separate. So it's been interesting to kind of talk about our, you know, you talked about the East Coast versus West Coast. And it's just, you know, definitely they, their markets are very different than ours, much more mature, much more competitive. You know, ours are more nascent. So we both had our own sort of interesting challenges. They deal with the competitiveness. We deal with states that are emerging that never really, you know, New York's really not, never dealt with uh, the AU market before. All of a sudden they're dealing with the AU market. Very different. <laughs> right. So it's, it's interesting. Yeah. So it's, it's been a really good collaboration. We've really enjoyed uh, working with SE Labs. They're a phenomenal group of people. Really, really enjoyed working with them. So. Excellent. Well, thank you. I'm glad we covered that. I would have just, <laughs> as I listened to it, I'm going to be like, 
you just really missed the, you really missed the whole bridge there. Yeah. Um, um, but no, Michael, uh, thanks again. And like I said before, uh, you're always welcome on the podcast. I really appreciate your insight. Great. Thank you so much for your time today. And, and thank you, our viewers, for listening in. All right. Well, before we get out of here, please make sure to like, share, and subscribe to the podcast. You could also help us out a lot by leaving a podcast, a, leaving the podcast a positive review on whatever platform you use. If you want to email the podcast, you can reach me at david at cannabisequipmentnews.com. And please subscribe to our daily newsletter so you can get it delivered to your inbox first. For Michael, <clears throat> for Michael Drozd, I'm David Manti. This is the Cannabis Equipment News Podcast, and we'll see you next week. Thank you for listening to the Cannabis Equipment News Podcast.